The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials in ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. The lady who founded it all, the woman who created the art instruction video business, first one to ever do it, was a lady by the name of Johnny Lilladol. We honor her today with one of her classic videos with her teaching. She's a great teacher. Welcome to my studio. I've just finished this portrait sketch, which I might use as the basis for a painting in the future, or I might use it to put a face on a character in some other type painting than a portrait. Today I'd like to share with you the portrait principles, tips, and techniques that you can use in your own work if you'd like to add figures and faces and give your work a little bit more meaning. Let's look at a gallery of my work and I'll show you how I've used the very techniques that I'm going to share with you today to make my work richer and fuller. Perhaps you've designed a painting with a simple composition that calls for a figure to give it a center of interest, as I did in this piece intended to teach the painting techniques of marble rather than those of painting portraits. Or. Maybe you've included figures in larger compositions whose faces are too small to need much attention to detail. But the central figure is turned away from the viewer as in the first painting to avoid the problem encountered with painting faces. To give the figure the central role in the painting with the greatest impact, you must be able to present a convincing face even when it is no bigger than your thumbprint, as in this small painting. This equally small face is anything but generic, and the drawing expertise required to render a life-size portrait is the same that is necessary to paint this small subject convincingly. As your skill in rendering faces grows, you'll find yourself giving a larger place to your figures, and your backgrounds becoming less and less important as a major player in the theme of your paintings. Eventually, the faces will dominate your compositions, needing little else to rivet the viewer's attention to your canvas, as I did in this and the following group of character paintings. The light falling across a properly drawn, delicately upturned nose brings this painting to life. This wholly imaginary beauty was created out of my knowledge of the structure of the head, face, and features, which will be discussed and drawn at length in the demonstrations. Not all subjects have feminine beauty but they all have a human beauty that identifies them as individuals, as with this proud Indian elder of a Taos, New Mexico tribe. The same drawing guides that shaped the dark-haired Caucasian beauty provided the basis for both the old Indian and my lovely Negro model. Once you learn the basic measurements, you will quickly learn to capture likenesses and paint people as individuals rather than character indications. This individual is my favorite subject and a fine head, my husband. Another of my favorite models is the little girl who lives two doors down. This expression is so typically her that I had to capture it on canvas. 
Knowing where to begin and how to express her unique personality is based in the drawing measurements and principles we are about to explore. Using her as a model, I created a totally different, older character for this painting by manipulating the measurements of her facial features into those of another equally beautiful person. The hardest thing about painting and drawing is knowing where to begin. There are many ways to approach it, but however you choose, the first marks that you put on the paper are the, one, are the only ones that you really have exclusive control over if you're trying to get a likeness of a model. Some people begin by drawing the outer extremities of the head and working in. Some people begin by drawing the eyes and working out from there. Another method, and the one that I use, is working from the center of the face and the plane comprising the nose. Once I've decided where I'm going to work, then I have to decide how big I'm going to work. The first mark that I put on the page defines the length of the nose. Now this is not necessarily the actual length of the model or the figure that you're trying to draw, but it's the length of the nose according to the size of the finished face that I want it to be. If I drew this measurement smaller, well then every other feature on the face would also be smaller in direct proportion. So this distance from the top of the nose to the bottom of the nose is the only thing that I decide arbitrarily. Everything else is related to this distance. Now, just to give you an idea of where we're going, let me put a bottom on the nose. And this distance at the top defines the brow ridge. And I'll, for the moment, we'll just give a suggestion of the lower part of the brow on either side of the nose. It may not end up there, but that's to give me a, a note that that's the eyebrow and not the eye. Once I've decided the length of the nose, then I need to know what is the width of the nose. The average nose is about half the distance of the length of the nose. Now, is that an inch or two inches? That all depends on how big you're going to draw your face. Just remember proportions, a half. Let's draw our sample face with averages. Now, no one is average. No one likes to be called average. But if we draw a face that exhibits the average proportions that we find in people, we'll have a believable portrait of a subject. Already, that feels like a, the right proportions for the nose. Some people's noses are wider. Some people's noses are narrower. And that's what you need to look at your model for, is to decide what makes that person an individual. Is his nose half as wide as it is long? Is it three-fourths as wide as it is long? That's the key to getting likenesses. All right, we've got the establishment of the middle third of the face. That is the area between the brow bone and the bottom of the nose. Well, a very important feature is located in this middle third of the face, and that's the eyes. If we divide this distance between the top of the nose and the bottom of the nose into thirds, equal thirds, the average face will see the eyes sitting on a line located at the upper third of this middle plane of the face. Now just to give us some reference points over here, I'm going to bring these measurements out to the side. This is the top of the nose. This is the bottom of the nose. Let's define the rest of the face so that we'll know where these proportions fit based on where the hair is and where the mouth and chin are. 
The average face can be divided into three equal thirds. That is, if I take the middle third and I place it here, we have defined the hairline that meets the forehead. This is the hairline. in the upper third, middle third, and the lower third defines the bottom of the chin. Now, Working from the inside out, let's get our features proportionate to this length that I have arbitrarily selected as the, as the nose length. On the average person, the eyes are the same width as the nose, and the inside corners are located just above the widest point on the flare of the nostril. So if I come up in a perpendicular line and find a point that is vertically right above the farthest point of the wing of the nose, I'm going to find the inside corner of each of these eyes. Well, how about the width of the eye? On the average person, the width of the eye is the width of the nose. So that makes it easy if we bring that width here and here, we have found the width of the eyes and we placed it properly. That was easy enough. The width of the nose is the width of the eye. And the eyes are located, the inside corner directly above the widest point on the nostril of the nose. That makes the eyes one eye width apart on the average person. Well, how wide is a person's face? On the average, it's five eye widths wide. So let's take this measurement of one eye width and let's bring it on out here. That's going to give us the outer perimeter of the face. Before we start drawing in the outer edges, though, let's get the other predominant feature, which is the mouth. The mouth is directly related to where the eyes are, and it's specifically placed in a proportion from the distance of the bottom of the nose to the bottom of the chin. If we divide this distance from the bottom of the nose to the bottom of the chin into e three equal parts, the mouth is located, this is the separation between the lips, on the upper third. Well, how wide is the mouth? That depends on your model and their age. But if we're talking about an adult model, that is someone between the ages of uh, 18 and 40, the average mouth width is the width of the pupils in the eyes. Well, let's find the pupils in the eyes. First of all, we'll drop the iris into the center of the eye crossways, both eyes, kind of hangs under the eyelid, and then we find the, the pupil. It's halfway in between. Now that looks like cat eyes. Of course, we know that human pupils are round, but that little line serves to give us the perpendicular 
line that's going to define the outer edges of the barrel of the mouth. The mouth will extend corner to corner to the width between the pupils of the eyes. The upper lip then sits above this line in a kind of flattened M shape, which we'll talk about a little later. And the lower lip is below that line. So that what you have then below this is the mound of the chin. All right, now we've got all of the major features placed. Let's go on up to the eyebrow. The eyebrow generally begins about the inside corner of the eye. And it extends in its arch out to the outer edge of the iris. So if we bring our arch to the outer edge of the iris before we curve it back down, and it extends beyond the eye, then we're going to have a correct placement for the eyebrow on the face. So let's bring it on both sides. The arch will come to the outer edge of the iris before it curves around the face. Now these are just placement things. They're not intended to, uh, to suggest an individual. This is your average face. If you were looking at a person trying to determine what his features were, you would look at each one of these little uh, marks that I've put on here, look at your model and say, is my model like that or is it different? The most important thing you can ask is, is the width of the nose half the distance of the length of the nose? That's the first question. That gives you the likeness. Well, if, it's, if the answer is no, then you need to ask two more questions. Is it greater than half or is it less than half? Some people have very wide noses. Some people have very narrow noses, and that's in relation to the length of the nose. The first thing to give you a likeness. The next thing that you're going to determine is, does the inside corner of this eye actually fall directly above the outer corner of the nose? Some people that corner sits inside. They're said to have close set eyes. For those people whose corners of the eye sit beyond the edge of the nose, they are said to have wide set eyes. So you already know these things intuitively and colloquially. Uh, we're just putting them into a more specific explanation or determination of how an individual varies from the common or the norm or the average. After all, none of us are average. We all are unique individuals, and it's how we differ from this that makes us have a unique look. Beyond this, the next thing we determine is, is the, is the mouth as wide as the distance between these pupils? Yes, it is. No, it isn't. If the answer is no, is it wider or is it narrower? Generally speaking, younger people, particularly children, you will find that their mouths will be narrower than the width of the pupils. In older people, you'll find the aging process will bring this through the wrinkling of the, the facial mass, it will make it appear that the corners of the mouth are wider than the distance between the pupils. Well, that was Johnny Lill at all, the founder of it all. She's terrific. We miss her. Anyway, if you want to learn more about that video, go to lilyartvideo.com. And remember, in the comments section today only, we have a special discount for you. Make sure to look for that. And thank you for watching.